we're happy to announce our second live event this year. On Tuesday, the 14th of November, we're going to be hosting Alex Lelch from Lelch Audio, also the owner of the Lowlands, a new wedding event center in St. Paul. Jordan Diorio will join me as a co-host for the first time. She is the podcast host of The Refund, and we're going to ask Alex all kinds of questions about being a serial entrepreneur, his immigration story to the United States, as well as starting two businesses and running both of them. So if you're interested in all things business, as well as a networking event within the construction industry, please join us that night. Again, that's the 14th of November. All details can be found at CuriousBuilderPodcast.com. This episode is brought to you by the Scout Guide Minneapolis. The Scout Guide is a curated guide of Twin Cities' hottest spots, companies, people, venues, and events, focusing on all things local and small business. When you pick up their magazine, it just feels different. You open up the ads, and they're not just you know the team in front of the building with a you know your normal photo. It's vibrant. It's unique. It might even be set in a completely unusual setting, something that catches your eye and not only tells the story in a picture, but lets you know that that's a company that you want to go visit. Look for something different this year, pick up the Scout Guide. You won't be disappointed. And if you're looking for advertising, I'd highly recommend it. They have an incredible social push. One thing that I was really interested in is that they will go to your events. They will go to your place of business. They will ask you questions that they then post on their feeds and they have quite a following. Find them on social media platforms at the Scout Guide Minneapolis. Minnesota is second only to St. Petersburg, Russia in terms of it gets really hot in the summer and really cold in the winter. You and your cohort of builders are pulling off is, is quite something to build a home that is livable and comfortable in really hot summers and really cold winters and two beautiful transition seasons. Welcome to Curious Builder Podcast. I'm Mark Williams, your host. Today, I am joined by James Vogley. Yes, we got a green light on that one. And uh, he is the CEO of Housing First Minnesota. Welcome, James. Thanks for coming into our studio. Great pleasure to be here. You are our first uh, guest in our new space. So we are now relocated in the world headquarters of Mark D. Williams Custom Homes and the Curious Builder Podcast uh, in Excelsior. And um, so, yeah, this is our new digs. We've got our video on YouTube as well as our website. But most of us uh, are probably going to listen uh, on the podcast. So. Cool. Honored to be here. It looks great. Let's uh, let's start a little bit uh, for those that don't know you outside of Minnesota. I mean, obviously in Minnesota, if you don't know James, <laughs> you have been hiding under a rock. You're very well uh, on the public scene, especially with the uh, housing first. But yeah. just give us a little brief intro of your history. I actually don't know some of your history before you came onto the scene with Minnesota or Housing First Minnesota. Yeah. But then we'll dive in a little bit to what Housing First uh, does for all the builders here in Minnesota. Yeah, you bet. So uh, born and raised in Northwest Minnesota, grew up in Monoma and graduated from Moorhead High School. It was adventurous. I uh, headed out to the Navy for four years, came back to the University of Minnesota, uh, worked briefly for Governor Ventura, did a year on his staff. Is that because you had the Navy, uh, the Navy staff? No, he was a Navy SEAL, wasn't he? He was a Navy SEAL. Yeah. yeah. And we actually had some fun, you know, talking about Navy stories. No, it just sort of uh, happened. I was in college at the time, okay. intern, took a role there. And through that network, a former colleague in Governor Ventura's staff got a job with the Builders Association of Minnesota. So I ended up there in an advocacy role. And then four years later to BATSE, which is yep. the, the Builders Association of the Twin Cities before we were housing first Minnesota. Yep. And I'm now on year 18 with Housing First Minnesota. So it's been- You've been there 18 years? been here 18 years. years. It goes so quickly, a short 18. Wow, that's so. I've been building for nineteen and a half years. I didn't realize you were there that long. Yeah, because you're now the CEO, and David was there before you. What were what were some of your career paths within Batsy and then Housing First yeah. before your CEO position? So I worked for one, two, three, four CEOs before me. I so see. the last year of Bob Hansen, who was there twenty eight years. So I was there two thousand six, Bob's final year, and was there in sort of a manager level advocacy role okay. and over the years ascended to the vice president of advocacy and sort of survived the crash okay as you were yeah well that was... i mean i started so i started in 2005 so i didn't really know bob i mean i knew his reputation yeah his name yeah but I, I actually didn't even know he was the ceo i mean i've seen him as lifetime achievement awards and things yes. like that but i guess i never i missed out on the fact that 
he was obviously president before. That was probably my dad's generation. Very much so. And, you know, Bob was part of the merger. So so the history of the organization is, of course, there was a St. Paul in Minneapolis. There was a merger in the early 90s. Bob saw that through and, and I came on board at the very end of Bob's tenure, made it through the crash. And then over the last 10, 12 years, you know, built the what we know as our advocacy program today legislative, regulatory advocacy at sort of all government levels, our legal program, our research program, and then certainly the talented team that's there now. I was an incredible team. Yeah. And now we're kind of the 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 envy of the rest of the country. I, mean, yeah. I know I'm drinking the Kool-Aid because I'm from Minnesota, and I, but I know I mean, yeah. we're celebrating our 75th anniversary this year. Yes. And I know it's the oldest in the country, and it's just kind of amazing. As other states, I've talked to other builders now as part of my outreach, both on the podcast, but just yeah. in general as my... Uh, network has expanded. It's amazing to me how many states have zero home tour presence. It is. It's remarkable. And we spent a lot of time. So yes, it's the 75th anniversary of the Parade of Homes. So 1948 in the fall was the first ever, they called it the trend home in Edina. And and here we are 75 years later, and we're just wrapping up. We're at parade deadline. It's going to be an outstanding tour. And there's something unique in Minnesota. And I'm not sure what it is. And I think even, you know, my predecessor going way back into the 40s and 50s, they were shocked when it worked because we, you know, started as sort of a single home in Edina. Then we said, let's do a several homes on a block. And then we took a big swing and said, what about scattered site? What if we in Hugo and, you know, I forget what some of the other cities were, but you can imagine New Brighton perhaps. And it worked. And we were getting thousands of visits in these far flung at the time suburbs. And there was just something about Minnesota. There's something about sort of our civic participation, you know, some type of social contract. I've had somebody tell me Minnesotans have interest and we sort of like to understand our community better. And the Parade of Homes was one of those vehicles. And I, I think there's something to that. I mean, I remember my dad built homes for 30 years. So he was mid 70s to like 2000, I think 2001, he retired somewhere in that time frame. And I remember, uh, I never went, but I remember my sister, who's a couple years younger than I would, would go to like the parade galas, or we call it the big night now, the Reggie Awards and the Trilliums. Yep. And I remember one year she went up there to collect uh, a couple of awards that dad won. In fact, one of them is in the wall uh, in, in the office here. And uh, I think one of the other builders goes, man, the competition keeps getting younger and younger. She was like eight years old at the time. And dad just, you know, sent her up there on I stage. And so I, to this day, my sister often, she lives in Colorado now, she's a hydrologist, but she often says, hey, just remember who won the first builder award. <laughs> Actually, it was her, not you. Yeah. But I, I think it, what I'm, where I'm going with this is that the, it, the family aspect, Absolutely. Uh, not only obviously home ownership is, you know, you raise your home. The American dream is home ownership. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the podcast, but specifically to the parade. I mean, I just grew up not only the son of a builder, but even on the years that he was retired before I started building, I still went to all the parade homes because I just, I mean, that's just what you do. No, like you go to the state fair, <laughs> yes. you know, you, you do these things that become kind of iconic to Minnesota. Yeah. And then to find out that a lot of states don't even have this is kind of just like earth shattering. Well, and my peers around the country, now some of them have larger parades, um, but what they marvel at is our ability to do 13 counties hundreds of homes. I mean, we'll have over 350 homes this fall. Um, we've had at our high point, 1,200 homes. Was that, was that 2007? Yeah, I, right before the crash. I remember it being like five, 600. I didn't realize it was 1,200. 1,200 was our was our, was our our peak. Yep. And, and obviously there's been so much resettling and there's been some contraction in all the merger and acquisition activity in the industry. But the point holds that there's something about our community that allows us, um, you know, an incredible platform. And obviously you and your your family and all the legacy builders that have come into this market are committed. So it's really fun, very rewarding. Do you think, I mean, that started way before there even was such a thing as a national builder, right? 1948, yep. way before that. What, what year did national builders kind of come on the scene? As, as I recall it, I'd, I'd probably guess like early 90s. Is that is that about right? I believe so. I mean, it was certainly before my time, you know, and I, and I came into the Builders Association in 2001. So yeah, I, I think in the 90s, you begin to see those market shifts. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm bringing it up is I, I think Minnesota had a large collection. I think it's, I assume it's because of our demographics, right? I mean, I'm a Scandinavian mud, if you will, so I can say this, right? I mean, a lot of our heritage is German and Swedish and Norwegian. A, yep. a lot of, and it seemed like a lot of that craftsmanship came down through Canada, came down, settled in Minnesota. I just feel like our trim work, our, our, our commitment to those trades seems to mimic a lot of Scandinavian values. I could be wrong. That could be my own bias and 
the people that I'm surrounded by. But just anecdotally, as I look around, I see some of that now their third, fourth generation, you know, and I see it continuing on this care. I'm curious of how that plays across the other parts of the country and why building custom homes was such a like it seems like national builders took a long time to get to Minnesota. And I don't know if that's because there were so many custom builders that they couldn't pry it out of their market share. Any yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a great question. And and I've talked to many of our national builders, you know, about this. I mean, there's a couple of factors. One is our land availability. And so that actually gets, I'm sure we'll talk some regulatory impacts and some of the uniqueness of Minnesota. But one of the things that makes us unique is that we have an urban services area. They call it the Musa line. And it's a, it's a line with sewer and water infrastructure. And we've always supported smart infrastructure. Um, but what when you create a line, what's inside the line obviously becomes more scarce and that spiked land supply. And I think a lot of national builders, as they surveyed in the 80s and 90s metro areas, our land costs were higher and that had an impact. I do think there was a strong legacy of local uh, regional builders. And, and we've heard from national builders and others that Parade of Homes was a big factor to come in the, here. In the success. To, well, to come here or it kept them away because the brand was so strong? It didn't keep them away. What what I've heard them, you know, over the years sort of, you know, anecdotally say it helped our regional builders tremendously. The marketing platform has a, I don't want to call it an evening effect, but it, it does something that allows, you know, sort of competition to, to rise with the parade brand, which we're very proud of. And interestingly, our national builders are major fans of the parade of homes. So they, when they get here, it's always a shock, like, wait a minute. So everybody does this parade and they've got, you know, their, their corporate headquarters and their connections. And over time, I think they win over, you know, sort of their, their bosses and their infrastructure that says there's something really unique about the parade of homes. And it's a, it's a big part of every builder, mid, large, small, the parade of homes is part of their marketing. I think. And just thinking about loud about this right now, like I think we've said the parade of homes so many times that I sort of forget about the word parade. Yes. And I'm just thinking right now, being like a 10 year old kid sitting on yep. the curb at 4th of July, which obviously just happened. Yep. And you know, you've got these different city parades yes. and, and everyone has a different float. That could be the 4-H club, that could be VFW, it could be yep. whoever, right? And in some ways that model is essentially what, except the parade, you know, the homes are on rollers moving around the town, right? Right. But it's kind of a brilliant concept that what I always appreciate about it is like, you know, come to my home, come yeah. to one of my competitors' homes. But really, I'm such a fan of our industry. Like, yeah. I want you to see all the homes because I would contend that at the end of the day, people, price is, a, we'll get into that later, price is really important. But let's just say I'm your builder, uh, uh, let's yeah. say of a strata. And let's just say there's, for ease of number, let's say there's five to 10 builders that could, could build what I build or for I don't know the actual number. Let's just use that for an yeah. example. And the point of it is, is that at the end of the day, if you're comparing apples to apples, still a little bit like car shopping, the pricing should actually be, if we're bidding the exact same thing, should be kind of the same. So yeah. it's really more about who do you want to work with? Yep. Who do you want to spend the next year, two years of your life, at least for the homes that I build yes. from a design and then, and then, and then of course, warranting it after that 10 years in our market. Yeah. Um, so, so price, while super important as a, a delineating factor in the very beginning, ultimately becomes something that I try to push aside because it's more about a relationship. Yeah. And I think the parade, I often talk about, so I have people that call me all the time, you know, whether it's on Google or whatever, and they'll say, hey, we're looking to build a home and they will be outside my price point or below my price point or whatever it is. I'll just say, I can't build it. But I tell you what, you're in luck. Um, the parade of homes is coming up this September, like it is every year yep. and like clockwork. And I'll say, I don't have a home but there's going to be 400 homes on tour. I would highly encourage you to go look at all these homes, yep. find people that are in your price point, then go to five or six of those homes, interview them at that. It's like a live interaction. It it's is like you're, you know, it's like you're, you know, you're bidding a live auction essentially you can. And then I can't tell you how many times we've won a bid or, or, or gotten the relationship that somebody met us at the parade that years later they came back and they said, do you know why I, I, I chose you? And I said, no, they said we were young. Actually, I'm building their house right now. They're down in Rochester, which we don't normally build, but we're opening up down there if anyone's listening. So anyway, the point is, is they said we went to, we were very young. We went yep. to a lot of builders. Most people dismissed us because we couldn't afford the home at that time. They said, you came up to us. You shook our hands. You engaged yeah. with us. The house was full of hundreds of people. You gave us four or five minutes. You asked, you were very personable and that was it. And like, how simple is that? That was just yeah. giving them time. I've often thought about that. Like what the parade allows you to do 
is like an open house, a graduation. It allows you to have this human to human interaction. So you're not a widget. You're a human being that gets to demonstrate your craft. And for the for the parade, I applaud them for this creation. It's amazing. It's amazing. And think about it from sort of the shopper, the tour goer. Some folks don't want to set up a one-on-one -on -one appointment with you just for a whole bunch of reasons. They they want to come in in a crowd. And if they want to break away, it's very clear. I've been in your homes, who you are, who your team is. They can make an introduction, but, but the parade has got the best of all worlds. You can connect directly with builders or you can more anonymously low pressure shop. People love it. And wherever you are, how many times do we hear, have I heard over my career? I came in to just be inspired. I wanted to look at wallpaper. I wanted to look at finishes and just get an idea for my own home. Well, life changes quickly. And, 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 and three, four years isn't that long. And next thing you know, they're now a prospect. Mm -hmm. And I think the parade has had a tremendous, I mean, 75 years. And we have several builders we've talked to that said, I've built one, two, three, four homes for the same family over a lifetime. That's pretty extreme. That's I don't know if cool. you have any, any I have, repeats. I have, I have a couple that are two. Yep. Um, I haven't, I'm, so I'm 42. I've been building for 19 years. So, I mean, just playing some statistics here by the, if I build, let's say for 40 years, I would expect we'll get a few in the three to four range. Yes. It's pretty uncommon. I don't know what other builders say. And it depends a little bit on your price point too, because when yep. I was first building homes, most of my homes, granted it was 20 years ago. So pricing in general was less obviously, but like you were, I was probably in the 500 to 700 range. And, you know, now those are my remodel ranges. Correct. You know, now most of my new homes is probably yep. one, three, one, four to five million, you know, whatever. And yep. so it, I've also changed what I am as well on top of that. Cause I've now the national builders at the, at the, I was always better at custom for myself personally. Yes. And so I want to do higher quality, more detailed, more customization. I mean, now a lot of the nationals are building homes well above a million dollars. And if you had asked me that 10, 15 years ago, I would have been like, you're crazy. Because sometimes people say like, hey, could you go and build homes at four or 500,000? I personally can't. And we're going to speak about that later in the podcast about just yeah. some cost and why we need affordable housing. It's just, that's not my personal skill set or, or interest. I'm a big fan of it and we need it. And I love yes. the national builders and we need them because we need you know, affordability in the market. But I'm also just amazed at their range. I mean, they are, they are, their range is way bigger than my range. It is. Well, so it's well said. I mean, obviously, I'm the CEO at Housing First. We are a big tent. We value and respect the challenges that every segment, including remodeling um, at all levels. I mean, it's a different challenge. To build at scale, $400,000 homes is harder than it's ever been. So I'm like you, I, I celebrate our mid and large volume builders that are able to accomplish that. That is a tremendous high wire. Like you, you are presented with, you know, sort of, you know, site challenges, budget, custom windows, you know, proximity to water. Those challenges are major for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are a big industry that's solving all types of challenges. But yeah, look forward to talking about yeah. the affordability because it's a big piece. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a minute. Let, let's go back for just one second and talk a little bit about the things, especially for those outside uh, Minnesota, what it is that Housing First does. And I'll just tip off a couple of the high ones. Like obviously I've gone, my continuing education has gone through there. So a lot of my yep. continuing ed credits goes through you guys. Um, Obviously, a lot of our networking and councils being involved in the community. I sit on a couple different boards so I can be part of some of the change, which I, I feel very, it's very empowering. And also, I wish I had started that earlier in my career. Wendy Danks actually invited me on yes. and she's like, hey, we need some young blood. Why don't you come on? And I was like, oh, this is great. You know, I, I had no idea what it was. Right. And then right. before you know it, you're like, oh, now I see why it's important to be involved. So those listening, I guess one of the biggest things I I was for an extreme extrovert, I was very late to the game for networking business wise. I always had right. a large friend group, but I was like, I didn't realize how much I love our industry and love our other builders and trade partners. And I just I love being around their energy and, and how to be a part of that to help just grow our overall community, because it may not be right for me, but it might be right for somebody else. And I, I often think of our ecosystem as the ocean and I just, I'm a diver, so I love the ocean yeah. in general. And I'm, uh, but I just think of like anywhere from like algae to the great white sharks, to blue whales, you need a complete spectrum of a healthy ecosystem. And I think home building is the same. You need everything working. And if one segment is too powerful or too weak, the entire ecosystem is affected. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. So housing first, I always describe it as, you know, there, there are three legs to the stool. The first you mentioned are connections. We communicate, we educate, we've got all sorts of, you know, sort of the standard fair trade organization 
elements, um, green building, like I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, that's one. Second is where the industry advocate, where the voice, where before the legislature, city hall, we're involved in research activities. We're trying to shape the housing discussions through media relationships, uh, issue campaigns. And then the third we've talked about are home tours. We produce six home tours uh, throughout the year. We're basically in consistent now home tour mode throughout the year with two parades, two remodeler showcase, two artisan home tours. First fall home tour starts yeah. uh, I've got here a, in October. I've got a remodel in that one, so I'm excited to yeah. have that from a timing perspective. Very excited. I believe we are at 21 entries, which is just spectacular. And this is our, you know, our first run. So really excited to, uh, to, to look at that season. I think that's going to be cool, but yeah, housing first Minnesota is pretty unique around the country. We're humbled by that. And I certainly, you know, we talked about my predecessors, I stand on their shoulders and this goes way back. Like we said, there was some real strong vision. And I think Minnesota, you know, when you look at the forties, fifties and sixties, there was a lot going on here. A lot of, you know, really, you know, a constellation of, 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 of positive, you know, Fortune 500 companies started, launched, moved here, growing, and we grew with that. You talk about an ecosystem. You can't have more Fortune 500 companies per capita without a housing market with some choices. And we were able to do that. And I think the parade was a big part of that. Yeah, no, it's a it's a powerful, um, I think, decision tool for people when they decide what they want. I also think too. I was just talking to actually a marketing company today, and I think as I've talked to other builders around the country, I think builders, I'm not going to say they have more power. Uh, I think they have more influence on the building of a home uh, versus other states. And what I mean by that is I think like what I've talked about, to, let's say builders in Washington or builders in California or, you know, um, Texas or New York, a lot of times people go to an architect first or a designer. And I'm not saying that they don't do that here, but I think from a percentage standpoint, I think the parade has shifted the power dynamic a lot to the builders. Because if you look at the tours, I mean, and it's not that their homes aren't gorgeous, like the AIA tour, the homes are incredible. Like I'm a huge fan of architecture, but their tours like two days. And it's not even, you can't even compare it. To, it's like the NFL versus like Pee Wee football. And I mean that without any disrespect. Right. I, I only mean in this, in the terms of the amount of organization, 75 years of, of building blocks, you've, we've created this infrastructure that really empowers builders. And again, having only grown up here, I just thought that's how it was everywhere. And so as you come to find out, it's a pretty rare and special thing It is, and um, it should be celebrated. It is. Yeah. No, the, the, you're, what you're talking about is, you know, if, if you consider brand as a collection of perceptions, the parade brand has been developed over 75 years and those interactions that you've had and I've had, and I, I was a college student and, and ended up on the parade of homes with my parents when they were in town and I was going to the U and I had no idea that I'd ever be involved in the industry or certainly leading the organization, but it had that type of, Hey, there's homes that you can just visit. So just even to be inspired and then just, you know, the other piece, I think that, that, and you know, this firsthand, the sales, you know, the prospecting process, the parade is a part of that. I've spoken to builders at trade partner meetings and when they describe their sales process, the parade of homes is a pillar of it. That's pretty rare and special. So that's also for our board of directors, for our, you know, exceptionally talented staff, that's a big responsibility. And we're already starting to talk, what are the next 75 years looking like? What is technology? How is community? How is in-person gathering? How do we, you know, continue to do what we've done since 1948? So well, exciting. I, I think it's impressive too. I mean, I saw you on the artisan tour, which was just in June. Yes. You know, you and your wife came out. Yeah. I think that it, um, anytime, I think when you have a CEO of a company and really anybody, because there's a number of staff and it's not just because you're associated with it. I mean, obviously Tom Craveras is out who's, yeah, you know, was an artisan and, and in general, but we see a lot of people that yes, your job is in the homes, but also sometimes I think I may even saw you on a weekend. And the point of it is, is like, anytime you have the CEO of a company out making the rounds, yeah. it, there is a relationship standpoint that says like, I see you, I feel supported. And it's a community that, that everyone feels embraced by. And you can't fake that. Like that's real. You yeah. can't, you know. I mean, yeah, sure, you can walk around and, you know, press palms and kiss babies like, a, you know, let's say the stereotypical we'll yeah. politician. But, you know, real conversation, like it, you wouldn't still be in this industry if you didn't love it. And I think it starts to grow on you. And then these relationships become so deep that it's like it's almost inesca inescapable. It's like the whirlpool of building. Like I actually knew as a kid, the one thing I didn't want to do was be a builder. And my mom was an interior designer because that's what they did. Yeah. Famous and, last words. Yeah. And then they retired. And like five years later, I was like, huh, maybe I should build a house. 
<laughs> and here we are. And here we are. Well, it's funny you say that. Our team um, at Housing First, and we have you know 23 staff, mm-hmm. and they're on every tour. And it's just a standard we started last fall. And I, and I sat with the team in a meeting, and I said, I think we should all go to four parade homes. And, and we got a Google Doc, and we signed up. Yep. They loved it. Yep. The builders loved it. Next thing you know, our content team is like, why don't you take, you know, a snapshot, a, a selfie, a picture of the home, something that inspires you. And next thing you know, that whirlpool that you described is moving. And we're a better staff at Housing First because we're better connected, not only to you and your team, but your customers. I went every weekend to the parade in the spring and I just walked to the edge of the crowd. And I, cause I feel like, you know, if we're planning our future, what, what happens when people are in your home? Um, it's fun to watch. People are universally happy. They're inspired. They're whispering. They're snapping their phone um, in every room. Isn't it's it, cool. Isn't it laughable? It used to be back, let's say, 10, 15 years ago. And there are still some builders that do this. I don't know. No why. cameras? Yeah. It's like, what are you doing? It's 2023. You want as many people to take photos and videos as possible. Yep. And like this idea that you have something. And I someone else mentioned this, and it, it, he mentions it a lot, but I like it. But you know, op, are you operating out of scarcity or abundance? And, you know, and going back to the relationship thing, yeah. like if you're going to choose me or or like you're just sharing an idea. Most of the ideas that we get, it, it, original thought is pretty rare. It's yeah. essentially, a, to me, a col- collaboration of a bunch of ideas that then produces something. And why not share it? And it's there's been such a change. It's funny you mentioned this. We did research coming out of the crash, so probably 2012. And one of the terms that the outside firm that we used came back with is radical transparency. And, and as an industry, it's funny you mentioned this, we were a bit more... Um, I don't know if we were opaque. We were just maybe guarded with with some of you know our our processes and our pricing and what was happening you know beyond the home building industry just in general with food labeling and calorie counts and just the internet changed the way we acquire information obviously and and as a home building industry I think we're you know we're catching up by saying show people what's in the wall cavity. What does spray foam look like? Why does it cost more than, you know, an alternative? And let's have that conversation. People want to geek out, Mm -hmm. um, but they want to see the home. And it's just, we are so, you know, ready for, we're photo ready. Oh, for sure. I think, and you're talking about process photos too. I also think it, um, I went to this uh, collaboration of a bunch of builders last year outside the state. And one of the themes was collaboration over competition. And when we came back here and and actually Morgan Molitor from construction to style, shout out to her, but you know, she and I decided, because they have these things called builder 20s, right? Yes. The idea back, and I think it was originated, I don't know how many years ago, let's just say 20. And the idea was like, hey, I, you know, if, if you and James and I are competing in the same market, you know, we want to we want to exchange information, but maybe not too much. Right. And it was that thought. And so then you would go out to your, your state, you'd sign a non-disclosure, you'd dive into your books, your profitability, all these things. And it's great. It's still wonderful. I'm trying to be in one, actually. But when we came back here, I'm like, there's nothing for me to hide. So we we actually formed our own. We called the S7. We picked like each person. We had three people that started it, and we essentially picked three people that we wanted on the on the uh, as builders. And we just formed our own group. No, we didn't make anybody sign anything. The idea is just like if you have a question, just call each other. So the other day, you know, uh, uh, Joe Braun, one of the co-owners of Style and Structure, I just love him and Danielle. And yeah. so like I called them out of the blue. And I was like, hey, I'm dealing with this. What do you think about this? I would do this. It's just such a great community to basically just ask those questions because why why do we feel like we can't share and why can't we ask for help? And I think, yeah, I think that I think this generation is radically changing building, at least as I know it. And I'm really happy to be kind of in the middle of it because I just love, I love the energy that it produces. Yeah, I do too. And I, I feel like if, if there's been sort of a persistent criticism over my career in the public affairs space, representing this industry is that we haven't done enough in the innovation and tech and that, you know, essentially you build them the same way you did in the fifties to an extent that's true. Um, to an extent that's what the customers want too. So there's all this interesting, you know, modular construction and, and 3d printing and how is technology changing and how much do you share about sort of what goes in, you know, to, to home building. You know, those are good questions for us to have. And I do think the spirit of innovation is is coming very quickly. I'm proud of our industry. I think we've really, really stepped up over the last decade. I think specifically uh, the engine, let's say Instagram. 
and I use Instagram, it could be any other photo sharing site, but that in particular allows you to see what other people are putting out there and it inspires. I mean, I use it not from an envy standpoint, but like, Ooh, that's cool. I want to try that. Or you get all these ideas. Plus your clients are bringing in these ideas too, right? Yep. I'll often have a, a video that I'll post and a client I'm building for will say, Hey, can we, are we putting that in my house? Like they might not even know. And like, so you get all this ideas coming together yeah. very quickly, very rapidly. And so you get a lot of times where people are saying, how do you do that? You know, how do I do that? So I think anyway, that pushes things up much quicker, much faster. I think so too. And and I, I would not underestimate the public's appetite for more information. I think it's, it's as much as you're able to give. Mm-hmm. And I think that's to our advantage. I really do. I think when we think about it as an industry, if I come to you and I'm looking at, at at buying an existing home or a newly built home, there is some built-in advantage to what we do. There is a transparency that that you can share when you're in a home that was built 90 years ago. There's questions that you can answer in a new build that really are not as easy to answer in an older home. Um, now there's remodeling, and that's sort of the uh, you know sort of that mid speed as well that says, look, you know, remodeling location, good bones home. But I, I think, you know, what we've seen in research over and over again is more information is better. Speaking of more information, I think just like the push in general for the country, but Minnesota in general, in terms of like energy production, cost savings, we're going to go into a little bit like some of the HERS scores for those that are listening. It's an energy report. But you had mentioned something earlier that made Minnesota special. I think our climate has actually been advantageous to us um, because when it gets negative 20, negative 30 in the winter, like we've had to build to a much more difficult, stringent code than other parts of the country. Um, how do you think that's helped us in terms of being more on the forefront of innovation? We built the best homes in the country by HERS index at scale. So there's, I think it's Vermont was an outlier. They had like 60 homes in, in the most recent year. And I think they were slightly more efficient than we are, which is to say the HERS index is like golf, the lower you score, the better. And for those listening, the HERS score is essentially zero would be a net zero house. Your home would produce and consume the same amount of energy. It's net neutral. And 100 would be, (laughs) I don't know, a convertible. I mean, like it just, there's no roof on it, right? Correct. And so a home that, what is our average now in Minnesota? So our average, I believe, and and certainly Tom Gavaris on our team would have the precise, we're in the low 50s, high 40s, which is outstanding, which is number one. At scale in the country. So it's funny, and this is anecdotal, but I remember years ago when I was, you know, lobbying and working on the energy code, we had an expert um, approach the dais and and, and tell the committee that was overseeing the technical group, Minnesota is second only to St. Petersburg, Russia, in terms of it gets really hot in the summer and really cold in the winter. Our Delta, that's funny. and I suppose it's a it's a hundred plus Fahrenheit degrees for sure, right? I yep. mean, it's nothing for us to go ten below, right? And to be you know ninety plus. Yeah, so, the humidity is as we're well celebrated for in the summer. Yeah, uh, the humidity can really make it. <laughs> yeah, can can make a difference. But when you think about what you and your cohort of builders are pulling off, is is quite something to build a home that is livable and comfortable in really hot summers and really cold winters and two beautiful transition seasons. I think it's made us better builders. And you, you mentioned some of the, you know, regional national builders. I I also think, you know, that type of building, um, is a challenge. I I think, you know, there are different challenges in some of the, you know, Southern markets, um, but they don't have to insulate and, and they don't have the, the footings and the, and the frost lines and some of the things that you have to deal with and you think nothing of it. Right. Yeah, they have termites and snakes and <laughs> another set of problems. <laughs> yes. of problems. This episode is brought to you by Adaptive. Adaptive is an AI technology that we use for all our cash flow management. If you're in construction, you know how difficult this is. The days of importing all your invoices, cost coding them, asking 10 people in your office where they get coded, if the, is this job approved, is this invoice approved, making notes, all that is now done through AI. Your invoices get automatically uploaded. After that, all you have to do is cross-check its accuracy per the jobs. This is now saving us hours per job per month because with a click of a button, you can now have the draw process automated, which has been a complete game changer. On top of that, it's going to track your lien waivers as well as your certificates of of insurance, making sure that everyone is in compliance before their bills are paid. This is saving us hours and hours per job 
per month, all with a click of a button. If you want to know more, check out adaptive.build. Additionally, we interviewed Matt Calvano on episode 15 of the Curious Builder podcast. You can find out more about it on our website as well at thecuriousbuilderpodcast.com. This episode is brought to you by Pella Northland. For 19 and a half years, I've been building homes, and 95% of all of my homes have used Pella Windows. I couldn't be happier to call them a partner in our builds and our remodels. Whether you're an architect, a designer, or a remodeler, I'd highly recommend Pella Windows. They can fit old homes, new homes, reclaimed, commercial, and really everything in between. Pella is a company that we trust and that we recommend to our clients. Additionally, in management, Peter and Ed have just been absolute fantastic people to work with, as well as mentors to me personally. So when it comes time to look for a window, I'd highly recommend Pella Windows. Find more at PellaNorthland.com. Also, if you're interested, you can hear episode one, where I interview Peter and Ed together for a great listen on business and Pella Windows. It's funny. I have uh, small kids, and I've often... I remember we saw a snake the other day and my little one was like, you know, what about that? Do you ever see that in building? I'm like, no. One of the reasons why I love Minnesota is there's nothing poisonous that lives here. Basically, it's too cold. They all too die. Cold. I think in the southern part of the states, we might have a few poisonous things. But yeah. In general, it's too cold. Yes, we uh, we definitely. That's one of the upsides. But yeah, I mean, you're right. The the quality of construction and that gets lost sometimes. It's it's one of the things at the parade when I, you know, kind of mentioned some of the you know, some of the tech and some of the, you know, interesting elements of what's behind the walls and, and the window quality. We're also, I mean, the windows um, legacy here, we're just amazing. I feel like we're so, or I am as a builder, I'm so attuned to moisture Yes, because that is my number one, you know, the enemy of- That's your building. nemesis. That's my nemesis. That's Darth yeah. Vader. So, I mean, moisture comes in all forms of content, but yes. um, I've sort of been awakened to some of the science. I'm not a, a total science guy, but I, I, I need to know enough of it to, for my clients when they ask questions. Right. I essentially have people on our team or consultants that we use, you know, depending on where people want to go with some of their, um, you know, green energy initiatives. But it is kind of interesting. Even our home at baseline is way more, you know, energy efficient than most of the country, most of the homes in the country, as you would say it. And so when people want to further that envelope and I'm all for it, it ends up starting, there's, there's this cost curve that starts to, and we often use this analogy that are you a green back greenie or a, um, like a green initiative. And what I mean by that is like, does the, does the money that you, do, what the investment that you put into your home, do you want to see a return on that? That's a green back greenie. Like if this makes financial sense to, let's say, put a solar array on or geothermal or whatever it is that you're trying to chase this lower score, or do you just so believe in what you're doing that while money is important, you want to invest beyond what the payback is in a short term, because you believe in this longer term. And where I'm going with this is the, you know, the European model is different than the United States. I mean, we, we moved a lot more jobs. We're a lot, we have a lot more land, obviously. So we move a lot more homes. You might know how often the average family moves, but like in Europe, they're thinking about this generally generationally, right? Triple pane windows, you know, extreme uh, commitment to quality because they're not only building it for themselves, they're building it for their grandchildren. That is a totally different mindset. And I, that's cultural. I don't, I'm not saying that, you know, we need to build like that, but it is sort of a, when I heard that recently, I was like, huh, that's a, I had not considered that before. Yep. Any thoughts on how we view that and how often people move, you know, kind of in the, the normal American cycle? Yeah, it was. So it was seven years pre-crash. I believe it's it's increased, not substantially, yep. but but it has increased. And it is, yeah, we're, it's nothing. Like I said, I do know of one builder that has four builds. Now one of them is a light comb, just kind of getting back to it. But yeah, I, I think there is a more nimble culture here than, than that maybe some of those European mm -hmm. markets. Um, yeah, and there's pros and cons. We just have to navigate it, right? So we, we do. Because sometimes you get a lot of pressure you know, when you read in the press, like, hey, you need to do this with your homes or you need to do that. But at the end of the day, we also are, you know, in some sense, early in a free market. Like, I have to build what my client wants. And, and I sometimes tell people that aren't educated, like, let's say you have this beautiful home in the tour, or maybe you have a home in the tour that's not what you would like as a brand. Right. And I, I, again, mean this with no disrespect, like that client, it's hard to say which client was more happier. You don't know. You weren't part of the process. What if the client says, hey, I want a polka dot house with purple window? You just don't know. You don't. And so I think sometimes I heard something recently that I really like. Don't judge me by my best work. Don't judge me by my worst work. Judge me by what I do in between consistently. I like that. That's beautiful. Well, I would say, you know, it's interesting. You're mentioning sort of, you know, customer. Um, there's obviously a large you know, variation in, in appetite, right? Your greenbacks versus more what I would call philosophically driven, mm -hmm. um, you know, buyers. 
it also then comes into question what should be the mandate, what should be the basic, and that's where Housing First comes in. And what we try to shape in in those discussions is that you have to balance, you know, two competing values, which are energy efficiency, very much a, a Minnesota value, but so is home ownership opportunity. And at what point have we? And we're number one. So if we're number one in the country, right. how much how much more at the base level? Our general feeling is when we're number one, we're building durably and energy efficiently. Let your customers and the, the homeowners of Minnesota decide which upgrades work best for them. And that's that trade off from a public policy standpoint that we, uh, I think, do a good job articulating because, you know, it's easy if you're if you're at the legislature, at the agency as an energy advocate, um, your intentions are noble. You are you are working on a very high priority item for for society, right? You know, I mean, the public is very interested in this. We come to the table and say, "Great ideas. What should be a mandate? What should be an option?" And that's where the debate really happens. I I, I completely agree with you. How how do you navigate that? That is a tricky thing. I think a lot of people, and I'm biased, I'm very disillusioned by politics in general. Yep. But yet we need them. You have two parties that are, or however many parties are involved, trying to come to a common consensus. You had shared, uh, what was the blue sky uh, consensus on the percentage that you yeah. shared with me so today? Yeah, so it's interesting in politics. There is, you know, there is a large conversation happening in public affairs throughout our state and country. And at Housing First, what we're trying to manage is focus on homeownership access. That is at, at the core, right? Our mission is home, home ownership opportunities for all Minnesotans. I mean, that's why you changed the name. That's why we changed the name. Housing First. Yeah. For that specific reason, you guys wanted to be known like, hey, housing is our main initiative, yes. not builders. Yeah. Right? And yeah, not, yes. And so we serve builders, but but our mission is home ownership opportunities. And when you think about the opportunity for home ownership, we stay razor focused on that. And we're in the mid 90s as far as you go across every demographic, all, you know, all strata, all subsets and cross tabs. When we research, home ownership is impossibly popular. You know, 96% of the people don't agree the sky is blue, but they agree that they want to own a home. Right. What a great place for you and I to be. Right. And so that's how we, you know, you asked sort of the question in preparation, like how do you work in these sort of strained political times? We stay focused on home ownership and we are trying to bring all sides together in that conversation. Interesting. How in this stat was published recently, and I'll give the framework, you can give me the specifics on it, but essentially it was a national builder's home. So we'll just pick whatever home, let's just call it 500,000. And in the five state area, so Illinois, Wisconsin, yeah. North the Dakotas and, and Iowa, you take that same home. And I was shocked that if you move that same home around, Minnesota was like, was it sixty, seventy thousand dollars more than some of the neighboring states? Yes, for the exact same house. Correct. Can you speak to some of the things about why that is, and then two, what can we do from a from a legislative point of view to change that? Because it, it can't be necessarily material. It might be a little bit labor, but a lot of it has to be what zoning permitting. Like walk us through some of that because that's a, when I saw that stat, I was a outraged, b dumbfounded, and then just like, now what? Yeah, it, it is. It is a regulatory cost connection to building a home here. The number one I talked, you know, briefly um, earlier about land supply. So, so again, we talked about sort of competing values. You know, sort of the sprawl and inefficient infrastructure is what the Met Council's MUSA line was meant to remedy, and it's done a good job of that. The challenge is when you constrain the supply of anything, what happens to the cost? It goes up. Our land costs are substantially higher than everywhere in the Midwest. We have a coastal land price um, dynamic. Interesting. And so I've that, never heard it framed like that. Because of course, when you think of the coast, you think, oh, of course, California is expensive. Of course. You and there's a big ocean there. And, there's the and then there's there. mountains on the other side. So California's at least got you know a decent excuse. <laughs> there's just not that much room in Los Angeles and San Francisco and the Bay Area to build. In Minnesota, we're on the prairie. And, and, and our argument is we need to modernize those policies. So when we built those policies in the 60s and 70s, well-intentioned, and we do a good job in not stranding infrastructure. So our sewer, our water infrastructure is, is efficiently you know, placed. We just don't have enough supply. If we had 100%, 200% more supply, 
the price of land would moderate, and that would be your first major step towards. Right, because that is a because I mean, it used to always be this this concept that you was one third, two thirds. It's not always the case of like on Minnetonka. Yeah, and rule I, of thumb. Yeah, and what I mean by that for those that aren't understanding that, but like if you bought a lot for five hundred thousand, you know, your house would roughly be a million. So you're, you know, again, this can play. It was just mainly like how do you value some of this stuff, right? And I yep. get it. Like if your land price plummets, you can build whatever house you want. Because a lot of times people will call me. And we'll say, Mark, I want to build a $800,000 house. And I'll be like, great. Does that include the land or not? And and it, like, is that a package? And people that are, are kind of in the know and know what they want, like they, they already know you can't include land in that conversation because I'm not producing land. I'm For what we do, you know, we do a lot of teardowns. We do a lot of one-offs, do custom designs. I'm not really doing a neighborhood. But half the clients are like, oh, no, that's all in. And then I'll point them to the parade. I'll point, you know, that's not a demographic that I can serve unless it's a remodel. Yep. And so then I'll point them to maybe other builders that I know or, you know, what part of the city are you looking in? And I just try to be a source of information yes. for them um, just to help them out. But that's interesting about the MUSO line. So you're basically saying if we extended that MUSO line or just simply had more lift stations, more, more basically more utilities in general, yes. that would help. So if, we, if, 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 if this, you know, if we have a land supply of, X, most engineered systems are built to greater than 100%. So like your, you know, your other engineered systems are at 200, 300% for surge capacity. That would be a way, a land supply surge would be a way, or to give some flexibility in other markets, there are no MUSA lines. And so then you have private infrastructure built to a code, not that different from the building code. So then you would allow in areas where you don't have met council infrastructure, you would allow developers to build infrastructure. And often what they do is then create a HOA-like entity that retires that debt over 20 years. So the infrastructure is privately built, which generally speaking is a more efficient way, cost less, there's cost efficiencies. And then it's, it's paid off over 20 years. It's like a special assessment on the title of a home. And that really, if you go into the Arizona and and the Texas, Illinois, and Florida markets, that's how they do infrastructure. There is no Met Council. So well, that type of- What is of, standing in the way? So what legislative branch would govern the Met Council? How, how people are obviously aware of this. I, obviously, Minnesota, or Housing First Minnesota, I assume, brought this up. Yep. Where does this get fought? Like, why is there, it seems con like, it seems like pretty low hanging fruit to change that. You know, Where's it's the objection. So it's at, you know, it's a legis. So the Met Council's power is derived from the legislature, but they are appointed by the governor, the members. So it's, it's executive branch, it's legislative branch. And, you know, I would say this is a deeply complex issue. You know, in addition to land supply, you mentioned zoning. It's worth mentioning. Yeah. So when we talk about zoning, um, no one at Housing First and none of our allied groups that we collaborate with are saying no zoning. But zoning needs to be modernized. We have growing suburbs that require, as a basis, a three-car garage. We are at a time, I've got a good stat. Our most recent census, there's never been more single-person households in recorded history in the US. So demographically, if households are smaller, why are we requiring 90s era large lot? Because if you have a three, you know this, if you have a three car garage requirement, well, there's a structure to garage ratio and then there's setbacks. The next thing you know, you have large lot, large structure. And in our you know, perspective is, if one of your customers wants a large garage, large structure, large lot, you will serve that client. But if you have a, a, a household of one that would like an 1,100 square foot efficiently built tuck under garage, cool, dense, near a transportation corridor, let's do that. Is that city by city, those ordinances? It is. So, I mean, some cities would be able to modify that to attract it. If they were more progressive, they could And say, some have. Yeah. Like, give me some examples. So Bloomington just, Bloomington has done tremendous work, Richfield as well. Bloomington just amended their two-car garage requirement down to one-car garage. I believe, and, and don't quote me on this one, but they took their lot minimums and I believe uh, reduced them by like 50%. It's outstanding. Very, very innovative way to say, hey, at a minimum, we're going to try to add you know, some you know, incentives and, and create some affordability space for households. And what we've heard nationally, where you can build small homes, small lot homes, they sell like that. And I just snap my finger. So it, they sell in a snap. And it's something we've really, we're a market organization. And, and we would love to see home choices. You talked about the ecosystem. We'd like to see the same thing. 
we need to produce starter homes at scale to get out of our undersupply. And that's really, you know, zoning and land supply are your big two. Speak to that a little bit. So I, I know basically, obviously after the Great Recession in 9 and 10 and 11 and 12, when things were so slow, we undersupplied the market. We are now between 60 to 90,000 homes or correct. units under what our market needs. Is that correct? Correct. So even even with high inflation right now, which I saw the paper today actually said it was at 3%. So yay. yeah. Yeah. Improving. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, where is this going to go? Because I've told my clients, like, I can't tell you what the next couple of years is going to be, but do I think prices will be more or less expensive five years from now? I think there'll be more. I don't think there's the amount of shadow of doubt that there'll be more. Yeah. So it's still a good time to um, to build and to buy. And here's the thing, because we're so undersupplied, even though costs are up, we still, housing is a fundamental need just because, you know, and obviously we see this in food prices as well, but it's interesting how housing is so closely uh, aligned with these things. How does Minnesota even make a dent in this um, because we're so far behind? We have to modernize zoning. Okay. It's the only way. So what you're talking about, I agree, you're talking in apples to apples, a home that you could produce today in 2023 and 2028, I agree, it's going to cost more. There's just, that's almost certain. The only way to achieve greater affordability and to put a dent in the in the in the supply, the undersupply, is to build a a more modestly sized and and modestly you know they call it modest densification. That's Zillow's term, and and they've you know entered this discussion and been a, a great partner of ours. And they said, look, a ten percent across the board densification would solve our our issue. Is that kind of even like Minneapolis? I happen to live down there where they basically went to like like an R2 or an R3. So for those- Yeah, the triplex. Yeah. So basically just saying like, hey, a single family home, if you tore it down or built a new one, like they would now allow a three unit, just trying to get density. Is that what you're speaking? They to? are. And, and of course, what Zillow is saying is every- All you know, counties. Community in yeah. Minnesota. That's not going to happen. We in, in that type of, you know, Minnesota's got 800 plus cities. There's going to be some uniqueness, but when we say units, we do mean apartments, condos, townhomes, villas, single family homes. We need everything. So in Minnesota, you know, when I drive into the office out in Excelsior, I mean, I see apartment buildings everywhere being built. Are th any idea what the vacancy rates are like? Are, are those being filled up and sold out? Like what, where is the future? Because obviously building a custom home is not an apartment. Is that still a, do people want to go there because it's m more affordable? Is that your quote starter home? Or what, what is driving all of these apartments that I see everywhere? Oh, I think affordability. Yeah. And I do think vacancies are exceptionally low. Yeah. Um, but it's, it, here's what's interesting. Since 2012, 2021, I believe, is the only year that we were in the positive territory um, in terms of, of, of taking down our undersupply. We were improving our deficit in the one boom year after COVID. Since then, we are adding to the deficit, if you can believe that. So it is, there's a great article um, by an author um, in, in The Atlantic, and it was titled Housing Breaks People's Minds. When you drive from South Minneapolis to Excelsior to work, you're seeing cranes and you're seeing construction and you're like, we must be building enough. I, have, I work in the industry and I, I fall into that and I know the data. And I, I see, I live in Victoria. So as I drive across town, I see all sorts of wonderful construction projects and it, it's cool. It's progress. We need that, you know, double, tripled at scale for a decade. That's really how far undersupplied we are. And it's a very hard concept because, you know, the connection to your home, you know, this is a builder. It's, it's as deep as any connection. I can't think of an institution that connects more deeply to its customer than a home. I... I don't know, from a product standpoint. I mean, cars, maybe there's people thinking, that really I, love their I cars. Thinking, I was thinking school, but ultimately a home is where you live. Like I'm thinking of affiliation to school, but you're, I think you're right. I mean, I think a home is where yeah. your memories are. People oftentimes will go back, like my neighbor actually in Minneapolis. Yep. Uh, he actually left, came back, bought his parents' home. Now he's back in the original home he was in. And like love there's it. that commitment to you know the vibrancy, the, the memories. And so a home is very special, obviously. It, it's very special. So I think it does something as we process information. And it's one of our challenges at Housing First is to try to shape this discussion. And a lot of times folks think we only want you know parade of homes. Oh, well, that's for expensive single family homes. It is true that the parade of homes is, you know, reflects the market. I think we had 62 homes in the spring parade above a million dollars. Um, from a from a tour going and inspired design, that's pretty cool. 
we really, really need um, more modestly priced homes. We need starter homes on the parade. So that's really, you know, the cause that, you know, we're swimming towards. I think that is a nice segue into here to the last part of our, our podcast, which is what a great career. I mean, you do, we just mentioned a couple of things that is going to make essentially building, I don't believe in anything as recession proof, having just gone through two of them in the last right. 15 years. But let's just say like as far as good careers. So, you know, if, if college is not for you or even if it is, um, somehow being associated with building, with the trades, what a rewarding career. But we just talked about we are 60 to 90,000 units short. And if it's going to take, let's just say, even if we start making a dent, a decade, two decades, three, yeah. maybe indefinite, I don't know. The point is, is like, you're talking about an industry where we don't have enough workers and the, and the increase of demand is going to increase. So what's going to happen to pay wages? Yes, exactly. They're going to go up. They're so, going to go up. So if you want to make, have a good career and maybe not be saddled with some college debt, what better on-ramp than to get into any one of a trade that interests you? It could be design, it could be building, it could be construction podcast it could be electrician it could be a painter yep. and i think i think having a wage that supports their lifestyle which goes back to home ownership but also making trying to reinforce and this is a cultural thing which i think is going to be harder how do you make it so that it's not uh looked down upon because it is a great industry and it and, and how do you and a lot of self-worth comes out of it i i talked to one of my framers and he was a stereotypical framer. He'd fish and he'd hunt and we loved that. And he would he would take photos of the home and he'd walk away and his name was Johnny. I said, Johnny, why do you love what you do? He goes, oh, at the end of the week, I like to look back and take a photo that of what I did the week before. He goes, I just I just built an entire house in a week. I just added a second story to a house. Like, and this is nothing against an accountant or, or, or a marketer or whatever. Like the point is like you physically built something and like it grew in front of your eyes. That is incredibly powerful um, motivation to get into the industry. It is. So at Housing First, one of our reflections over the last year is that, that we're called to, to go more deeply into the discussion that you just described. The Parade of Homes is a powerful platform, as is our public affairs, our legislative, and our, 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 our you know, ability to connect um, with the public through, you know, all of our association platforms. We need to do what we can to articulate what you just did. This is an industry of well-paying jobs, rewarding jobs. The concept of I built that, that's powerful. The entrepreneurial pathways are exceptional in this industry. And 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 we don't want to be a counter to college. What we are, you know, trying to share, you have choices. Young Minnesotans have choices. I'm a parent, you're a parent, you know, as 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 parents I think you know we have a responsibility to uh, to share in this industry the opportunities, and that's something that Housing First hasn't done an adequate job of. But this is a national issue, and and from a, a trade standpoint, and just from a a when you look at all of the opportunities, and we're talking immediately leaving high school and looking at fifty thousand dollar average um, wages in certain disciplines. That's pretty enticing, and and the and the, the the debt ratio for for students, and there's just a deeper discussion that we have to have, and for folks that like to work outside, like I said, the entrepreneurial, you know, if you want to run your own business one day, starting, you know, in one of your trades, you don't know where that goes, and how many of your peers started out on a crew and are now sweeping a house. I mean, my first job was sweeping sweeping houses, right? And here you are, yeah, and here you are. Yeah. So if you don't want to become a builder, don't sweep a house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll get you'll get hooked. It so it is. I mean, so housing first is in the lab, uh, so to speak, and we are looking at creating a, a a mechanism, a certification program that would signal to you as a builder, to signal to parents, to guidance counselors, to support networks, and and to Minnesotans to say I could get some level of training, safety training, get some on site. Uh, exposure and and learn a, a essentially a first step, you know, curriculum, and that would be a way for me to raise my hand and say I'm interested. And then of course there's there's you know different technical and trade schools and and on site and on the job training. And I I think that's something that I'm very encouraged by is companies like yours and your trade partners are willing to step up and do more training maybe than they did in the past because I think that's going to be the necessity you talked about an aging workforce, we're going to have to bring a different set of solutions to this challenge. And, and part of it's going to be 
um, to look at all the tools. There are, like I mentioned, certifications that Housing First is working on, but there's online LinkedIn learning. Um, you know, as, as you bring people along, there's all sorts of ways to enhance their, you know, their potential um, once they reach you. So that is, you know, the conversation we're having. You know, a big part of anything is education. And I know you guys already do a good job of that. And you, I know it sounds like you're in the beta lab working on this path. Do, you, do we have some rough roadmap? Is it a six month? Is it a year? How, how long and does this take to kind of formulate? And I'm sure there's lots of partners that I'm not even aware of, you know, whether it's high schools or Votex or, you know, businesses that would then hire these people. How, what does that process look like? Yeah, we're trying to be the hub and, and we want to be a collaborator to spokes at, at every level, school district, community organizations, religious organizations. I mean, there are all sorts of folks that we're in discussions with that are telling us we need, we need it packaged. We need a curriculum that the industry will recognize. I think Housing First has a brand that would be trusted. And so that's what's taking us the longest time. I think we'll be in, in, in much, much better um, position to evaluate in three to six months. So we're in that beta phase of just getting the kinks worked out and, and looking at a certification that can be four intense weeks, nine weeks, which is a, essentially a high school quarter, 18 weeks, a high school semester. That's, you know, sort of trying to meter all that out and getting all the parts, you know, to work together and the equipment and the donations and the online portals and then the placement. If you come through our certification program, how does Mark D. Williams how, how do you connect with with this young talent? All those pieces are, are being worked upon now. And, and I do think, you know, we want to make substantial progress by the end of this year. One thing, and just as and we could talk about this for an entire podcast, and actually maybe we should next spring yeah. bring you back on to see where it's gone. Because I have That's some, cool. we've talked, I've talked to a few other builders about doing, and I've reached out to you a little bit about this, and I'd rather do it in concert versus solo. But the idea of getting a handful of builders to do some sort of a speaking tour to high schools. Because yes. I feel like, you know, um, some of this, the organization would be obviously beyond me personally, but, you know, speaking about what we do, I'm happy to do it. I had a kid yesterday that uh, we, we do a lot of mentorships with Minnetonka High School because they're less than a mile from our office. Yep. And they have this program called the Vantage Program. It's a business uh, a class that they can elect to do. And they pair them with a local business. And for the last four or five years, they have a group of 12. This year I had two sets. They actually helped me launch this podcast. So I had 12, uh, I had 24 kids and um, I knew it while I was going through the rebranding process of my building company. I said, oh, I'm going to start a podcast. Will you help me do the research on it? You know, I let them look at the fonts. I let them look at, you know, our market generation. I had them do stuff around the country. And, and, and anyway, so this gentleman, uh, Grant is his name. He's a junior in high school, came yesterday on Tuesday and he wanted to shadow me for the day. And, you know, seeing the podcast now that it's set up the studio, uh, seeing what we've done and like he was super empowered by that and rightfully so he was yeah. there at the origin and how cool was it that as a business person these kids could be a part of literally creating a business although that doesn't happen every day you know you, that would be a pretty rare instance actually but the point is is i can't tell you how invigorating it was for me like it's so cool to be around the, the ideas that they have and the gender and the, and the talent and so i would love to just go speak to yes high schools and because if from an education standpoint if we can just show them what you could do and it might not be for them but that's okay too because how much of it do they even know you know it, it is what's being exposed to them in high school i don't know well i i think there there has been a, a massive contraction i mean i i guess i'm old enough where i did have tech ed yeah so um mm -hmm. in 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 junior high and i loved it it was fun we played with the jigsaw and yeah. you know all the safety and we had so you know classes to, on to be clear did they not have that in any schools or just some schools i th i, I think it is it is limited okay. in comparison probably to what you and i experienced yep. um and, and i feel like that's part of if, of our platform is can we work with schools and and provide a module a curriculum that they can implement um, and are there resources that we can marshal um, because I don't think every school any school district is the same and I think it was probably more uniform back in the 80s 90s um, yeah, you know, we had shop class home ec and I've heard that a lot of those classes are gone now right? I was shocked to hear that I'm like what do you mean you I get, agree. You don't, you don't get CO2 racing cars. You don't get to make a, a wood car and race it down the hall. We made wood cars. I learned how to make an omelet in home ec yeah. and it was very helpful. Frankly, I still remember, still use it. Yeah. So I feel like, you know, that is one of our, like you said, we want to be a collaborator on this. There's good work happening in many different places. We want to add to it. And, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, your friend and your, your colleague who, you know, said, I built that. That's a powerful campaign that the Parade of Homes, Artisan Home Tour and Remodeler Showcase 
we're going to work on that because I think when you're touring homes, I think folks underestimate how many companies and how many hands and how much innovation and hard work went into that home. And there, there's a way we could feature that. And there's probably people, maybe parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends, neighbors that are saying, wow, I know someone that would love to have a chance to work on one of your projects. Well, guess what? You're looking for that person too. So we got to find a way at Housing First to help use, you know, we're, we're privileged and, and we want to use that to help you connect and help them to connect. Where do like the Dunwoodies and the Hennepin Tech, you know, and I'm sure there's a lot more that I don't know. Um, where where are they playing in this whole sphere? Yeah, doing great work, yeah. um, great programs. And, and, and the way we see the Housing First um, certification program would be complementary. It would be a much smaller scale. Those, you know, sort of more mature degree programs, it'd be great to feed, you know, a high school student that went through our you know, nine week curriculum then to say, look, I want to go to Dunwoody. I want to go to Hennepin Tech because I learned enough. I got just enough to say, okay, this is what I want to do. Yep. Love it. And that's where we see ourselves fitting. We see ourselves as a support for- they would love it as much as we do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We're not positioning this as an alternative. We're saying, you know, there is a massive need and really, I think you hit it. There is an awareness gap and it's bigger than probably you and I even understand it to be. So that's a lot of good work, but that's something a trade organization is well positioned to to try to address. Before you came on, and you kind of already shared some of the starting salaries, but I had reached out to my HVAC electrician and plumbers, and they're all pretty similar. Yep. So like coming out of coming out of high school, someone who's green could make roughly twenty two to twenty five dollars an hour. Yep. Within a few years, you could be thirty to forty bucks an hour. And then you know whether you do journeyman or master, there's all these different tiers, and a yes. lot of it, you know, you have to be competent in those times. As, those types of things as well. But what was interesting is I think it was the plumber said that he felt that roughly for every master, uh, no, sorry, the electrician, I'm sorry, the plumber, um, he said that for every seven master plumbers that were leaving the market due to age in a declining industry, only one journeyman was taking their place. Wow. So you have this massive attrition of talent, knowledge, and workforce, all three of those things, which is crippling. So anyone listening, make sure you have a great relationship with your trade partners because until some of this stuff can transition through, because yeah. the market will take care of a lot of this. It I mean, will. If, if you're, if you have to, if you have, if you have to pay someone, you know, a hundred thousand dollars to, you know, hang a sheet, sheet or sheet rock, I'm going to quit being a builder and I'm going to go sheet rock. Hang you sheet can rock. hire me. Absolutely. Uh, but the point is, I mean, free market will handle some of this, but in general, like we have a major issue and I know I'm not the only one talking about this, this has been very well publicized, but yeah. It's just important for people to realize what a great career career you can have, and it, you can make you can make very good money. You can make very good money, honorable work, fun work, um, exciting, rewarding, and so it does check so many boxes. And you know, it's it, it's interesting to think back where I don't remember. You know, so there were no proclamations. I think it was just a slow contraction, and that's just interesting how some of those things you know happen. And it's just something we're reflecting a lot at, at Housing First, saying okay. What are just the foundational principles? At no point do you ever stop replenishing a workforce. And that's something as we look back, that would have been a great thing in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s to really be emphasizing because now it's like, whoa, we're 25 years behind and we have a lot in front of us to, to fix. As we close down now, where can people, obviously in Minnesota in this case, unless people want to move here, which they're certainly welcome to, yeah. we have a lovely state, but where can people get involved with Minnesota Housing First um, with, I mean, obviously they can contact you, but you have a, a huge staff as well. Um, where would people, if they want to get involved in committees, if people, if builders listening want to be involved with uh, community outreach, and we haven't even talked about the the Housing First Foundation, which yeah, can take another half hour. We'll yep. talk about that another time. But how would how would they how would people listening get involved? if they feel passionate about this topic. Yeah, I mean, I would go to housingfirstmn.org. That's our website. Look us up, uh, connect. We have an exceptional staff, like I mentioned, um, a couple dozen committed, um, you know, best in class. I think we have the best team in the it's nation. Incredible. The communication is unreal. Yeah, I, I just am so proud of, of all of them. And we have an outstanding board that is supportive. Um, and, you know, I've been in this role a year and, and I've had questions, can I be involved? There is a place for everybody in our industry at Housing First. We will find a place in our committee structure and we are um, reinvigorating our young professionals network, which is exciting if you're, I believe under 35 is the new cutoff. So I think you and I are out. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but but we want to welcome yeah. um, our young professionals in and let them explore our different committees. And we have you know policy and advocacy and green building and awards and artisan home tour and yeah. parade of homes. And there's so many different ways to contribute. And the workforce program is going to be huge. And so that's going to be another way. Obviously, you mentioned the foundation as well. Um, so yeah, there's something for everybody. Are you guys out of curiosity? Are you guys hiring as well? Are you trying to fill any needs? We are. We first? yes, we're a growing company, okay. and and we continue to you know as as our home tours expand, um, as our you know advocacy and communications and need to create content expands. We are growing. Okay. Yep. That's good to know. Um, closing note: um, You're a very uh, intelligent, well-spoken individual. What do you do for continuing education for yourself personally, and maybe just a few things about you know what do you do when you're not thinking about how to increase housing and affordability? Yeah, so kind of personal. I mean, I am a I am a nonfiction reader, and I am am really inspired by going way back. So I like looking at you know you know business leaders, presidents, especially. I'm a student of political science and love. Uh, presidential history. And what I always find interesting is to go back 50, 100 years and look at leadership challenges without any of the technology that we have. And what's amazing is sort of the the challenges feel very familiar. And I would encourage those who like that type of uh, content to read it, you know, the things we're wrestling with now. Um, you know, some of the problems are timeless. So that's that's pretty cool. I, I tend to, 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 to rely on on historical you know, kind of cool moments in history and, you know, what was happening there, what was happening with the chief of staff of Theodore Roosevelt when he was president and this issue confronted us. You know, I, I really enjoy that. No, that's very cool. And then on, you know, I am a college football enthusiast. Um, absolutely. You're um, a gopher, right? I'm a gopher, um, you know, and I, we both are and, yeah. you know, still waiting for uh, us to get, uh, <laughs> get to the Rose Bowl. And, and I'm a, I'm a patient optimist there. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a big hobby of mine. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for coming on. I know you're busy. And for everyone that's listening, um, we'll have everything tagged in the show notes as well. And uh, we'll try to have you back on next year. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Mark. All right. Thanks, James. Hmm. Thanks for listening to the Curious Builder podcast. If you like what you listen to, please give us a five-star rating and write us a review. It really means a lot. It's a great way for us to just understand what you like about the podcast and what we can keep doing. So like and review and please share with your friends and family. Find out more at CuriousBuilderPodcast.com.